Hi everybody, my name is Emma Bergeser. I'm the international coordinator of the Women's Power to Stop War uh, campaign. Welcome to episode four of our Women's Power to Stop War webinar series. I'm very glad so many of you were able to make it today. Um, I'll just run you through a few technical uh, items and then uh, tell you a little bit about the background of this webinar series and then I'll hand you over. Um, so first, uh, please understand that you are all muted. That is the format of the program. Also, we cannot see you, so you can do this webinar in your pajamas if you want. Um, later, after the presentation of Janie Leatherman, you will have a chance to ask questions, and I'll explain then how that works. Um, also, if anything goes wrong, if your computer freezes or if the program doesn't work, if you lose your connection, we recommend you do a force quit and then log in again using the same uh, link that, you were, uh, that you've used to come in now. Um, finally, we are also recording this session, uh, like all of our webinar series, so that we can upload it later. Um, so for those of you that missed it uh, or have to leave early, you can watch back the recording, but also keep this in mind if you do ask questions. All right, so then to give you a little background on why we're doing this Women's Power to Stop War series, um, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom is turning 100 years old next year, which makes us the longest surviving women's peace organization in the world. So we thought that was a reason to celebrate, and we gave name to the movement Women's Power to Stop War. Uh, which is all about strengthening, celebrating, and connecting the work of women peacemakers all over the world. So to do that, there are lots of projects and activities going on, just like this webinar series. And if you want to find out more about everything we're doing, please have a look at the website. Um, but the way that all of these projects are coming together is at our major international conference next year uh, in April in The Hague. Um, this is the place where women peacemakers from all over the world will come together and form a new peace agenda for the 21st century. So we hope you mark your calendars and I hope to see you in The Hague. Um, that was for background for the series and then for a little background on why we chose this subject specifically for this webinar. Uh, I think most of you will probably know next week uh, the Global Summit to End Sexual Violence in Conflict is taking place in London. This is a major summit organized by the British government, but hundreds of NGOs will be there. So, of course, including WILF. Um, WILF will be organizing a number of events and monitoring many, many more. So if you're interested in what exactly WILF is doing, please have a look at wilfinternational.org forward slash PSVI or follow us on Twitter and Facebook where, of course, we will also keep you updated. All right, so that's it for me. I will now hand you over to Barbara Chojinowska. She is the fantastic coordinator of our academic network who has been putting all these uh, webinars together. So I will get rid of my webcam and I will unmute you, Barbara. There you go. Yes, hello everyone. Welcome to our fourth webinar that is hosted by the Academic Network of Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. I will take just two or three minutes of your time. Uh, first, I want to say for those of you who are not familiar with the Academic Network, this is a think tank that addresses the issues of gender, peace and security. And uh, the aim is to link and to connect a global network of academics and peace activists uh, in order to share knowledge on women, peace and security and to include academic expertise into political actions. And on these two slides you can see our wonderful scholars. And as Emma already mentioned, this is our fourth episode. And if you couldn't participate in our previous webinars, they were all recorded and you can watch them online. So the topics we covered before were the introduction to the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, disarmament in Africa and its relationship with food security. And finally, translating uh, the international instruments into women's grassroots activism.
and the topic of our webinar today is sexual violence in conflict. And I will now introduce our wonderful speaker, Janie Lederman. Uh, Janie is a professor of politics and international studies. She is the director of the Fulbright program at the Fulbright University and also the project director of the collaborative project in student learning. <coughs> she has been a consultant in conflict resolution for many years and her consultancy included, among others, the U.S. Ambassador at Large for War Crimes, the United Nations University, Catholic Relief Services, Search for Common Grounds, the Council of Foreign Relations, and other organizations and institutions. She works on several projects on border politics uh, and migration, on safe spaces in humanitarian context, and on sexual violence in armed conflict. And in 2011, <coughs> sorry, in 2011, Policy Press published her book, Sexual Violence and Armed Conflict, in which she explores the catastrophic and very often unhidden, uh, very often hidden consequences of sexual violence for women, men, and girls and boys, and how they are linked to the political economy of violence and plunder of economic resources. And uh, yes, and the book was recently translated into Spanish. So now I give the floor to Jenny Lederman. <coughs> Hello. Well, it's wonderful to be with all of you um, this afternoon, this evening, and this morning, depending on the time zones. Um, I'm very excited to have this opportunity to share with you some of the work that I've done on the topic of sexual violence and, and, and conflict. Um, I think we have a terrific uh, group of participants uh, from many countries around the world and it will be a wonderful opportunity following my remarks to, to hear from you, to learn about your insights and, and to discover um, ideas that you have and, and aspirations um, that you're working on for um, improving the kinds of responses that we can bring to um, prevent sexual violence and conflict and also to support um, survivors, their families and their communities. Um, I'm sitting here in my office in Fairfield, um, Connecticut, at my university, Fairfield University. I'm here with my technical assistant, um, Debbie, who's uh, been a great support in, in helping uh, organize this um, from my end. and. Um, and you can see me here in my office. So um, I hope that um, all of you are, are coming uh, from equally um, beautiful settings as, as we are here today. Um, I want to start out by, by talking about ways of conceptualizing um, gender-based violence um, in conflict situations. And the first image that I want to bring to you is a photograph of an intersection um, in Bukavu, in eastern Congo, and um, I thought this was just absolutely a terrific image to use to start off with, um, in part because feminist scholars have thought a lot about the way that um, violence against women um, is a function of the various intersections of our own lives, as those intersections involve our identities, our, our racial identities, our ethnic identities, our gender identities, our sexuality identities, um, and, and our geographies, and including uh, the geographies of violence in which um, many women uh, live around the world, whether in their domestic um, context or in their local community or their larger um, region um, or country. Um, so this picture, um, and I'll describe it, I, I know some people may be um, just listening and not seeing the images, uh, so I'll make sure to describe the images as I go. Um, this, this photograph is, as I say, an intersection in the streets of Bukavu, and it features a, a billboard, um, a large sign, uh, that's sponsored by uh, the World Bank, and um, it's advocating nonviolence, um, well, actually it's advocating against um, sexual violence and also against the, the transmission of HIV AIDS. And uh, this is part of a really fascinating tour through Bukavu that you can find at the website that's uh, linked um, to this presentation, uh, which will take you through the streets of Bukavu. And um, 
and the, the, the slideshow will show you that it's, it's not only at this intersection that we see images that relate to questions of gender and gender identity and um, the gender experience in um, Eastern Congo. Um, gen uh, sexual violence in war, in my mind, is one of the most um, serious affronts to humanity. Um, it rips apart uh, people's bodies, um, it rips apart families, it tears apart communities, it really destroys um, uh, our, our global community. And it's also a very pervasive element of conflict. And the pervasiveness is a function of pre-existing conditions in society um, in many parts of the world that, that already place women and, and girls in particular in highly vulnerable gendered situations. Um, with gendered inequalities in particular. And so the pre-existing situation in which women and, and, um, and children especially find themselves around the world make them more vulnerable as conflict begins to escalate. And so we see that sexual violence and, and conflict is a pervasive element of conflict in all phases of, of violence from the onset um, to the to the aftermath of, of, of violence. I also think that it's a force multiplier. Um, it has so many um, devastating effects. Uh, so it's a it's a really particular kind of a weapon of war that I, I think we need to think a lot about in those terms. Um, it it escalates terror. It, it escalates um, the threat um, that that groups can bring to communities. Um, it it augments the the gravity of the suffering of the communities. Um, and it's also a f it's a cheap weapon, and it's practically inexhaustible um, when groups have been uh, encouraged to use it as a weapon of war. And in so many societies around the world, uh, sexual violence carries a severe taboo uh, violation. So it also has an extra kind of force as, as one of the most serious kind of um, to, taboo violations in many cultures, so most cultures. Um, sexual violence subverts traditional culture, traditional social orders, and um, so it also makes it difficult for societies to put the pieces back together again in the aftermath of this kind of violence. Um, I think sexual violence and armed conflict is a key factor in the global erosions of safe spaces around the world, and that it's also a key element that fuels political economies of violence. Um, and furthermore, um, sexual violence and armed conflict casts a really long shadow um, over its victims and, and survivors, um, including their children, who, who may be children born of rape, um, as well as their communities, and even future generations who may experience the, the transmission of trauma uh, from the experience of, of the sexual violence in the conflict. Um, so that's a little bit of a general introduction. Um, the international humanitarian community uh, defines uh, gender-based violence um, as an umbrella term used for any kind of harmful act that's perpetrated against a person's will and that is based on socially ascribed gender differences between males and females. And of course, um, the UN Convention on the Elimination of Dis Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, also um, is very much concerned about gender-based violence and um, defines violence against women um, means any act of gender-based violence that results in or is likely to result in physical, sexual, or psychological harm or suffering to women, including threats of such acts, coercion, or arbitrary de uh, deprivation of liberty, whether occurring in public or private life. So uh, gender-based violence is a form of discrimination um, that um, gravely affects women's um, enjoyment of human rights. Um, and so I want to also point out with, with this image here um, that I think it's useful to think about sexual violence and conflict not only from a temporal kind of perspective, and I think much of the organizing of international response to conflict is based on a, on a time notion of how conflicts emerge and escalate and de-escalate and terminate, uh, but in practice conflicts are not neat and simple or linear like that, and they, they erupt and they, they they, they simmer and they re-erupt and they move to this region or that region. And so I think it's more useful to also include a spatial dimension to our thinking about um, conflict and especially the spatial aspects of sexual violence in conflict. And I hope that this, this image of this intersection would also draw our attention to the kind of flows of people and goods and, um, and, and, and crossings of borders 
that are also very much part of um, conflicts today and the kinds of impacts that sexual violence and, and conflict has from a, a spatial um, type of perspective. So I think we can go to the next slide. So what is conflict-related um, gender violence? Um, I, brought, I brought you here um, several images of, of artifacts um, and also a setting um, that come from the U.S. border with Mexico, uh, which is a highly, highly militarized um, zone, um, and also a site where um, women and children, boys, men, uh, families, um, cousins, all kinds of different friendships and relationships involved in, 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 in crossing um, into the United States through very perilous um, kinds of mountainous and desert um, conditions. These, these photos come from Nogales, uh, Sonora, Mexico, and, um, and images that I took from artifacts of migrants uh, that were found in, in the area around Green Valley in Arizona. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's telling that um, someone who might be fleeing violence is hoping for a better life. In this case, um, we can see that someone was carrying shoes and combs and makeup. And also, there's a beautiful um, textile um, in the bottom corner. Um, that there must have been a celebratory type of gift that I could imagine a grandmother or some relative gave to, to someone or they kept it as a memento of their family as, as they were traveling. And I was reminded, um, I think it was Carolyn Nordstrom who pointed out, you know, what you think about what people carry when they're fleeing violence. And you have so few options of things to take with you. Um, those, those artifacts that you have on your person, I think, tell a lot about what's important to you in your life and what your aspirations might be. And um, conflict, um, Related gender violence um, destroys, you know, those those aspirations in ways that are are very um, uh, pervasive and 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 um, systematic. Um, there were many different forms of of gender-based violence. Um, we typically have seen, in, especially in the United Nations Security Council resolutions, um, discussion of women and children as a kind of category, and even though many times women and girls are the common victims, um, we have to realize that, that men and boys are also victims of sexual violence and armed conflict. So we need to, to widen our horizon about the potential victims and, and the kinds of needs that survivors have as they vary um, in gender terms. And, and also um, people of different sexualities will experience um, gender-based violence in, in their own ways um, during conflict. Um, and so that's another consideration that needs its own um, special attention. Um, sexual violence in armed conflict ranges um, from particular incidents that, that happen along the way um, to, to strategies of genocide. And we saw in the case of Rwanda that, that sexual violence was really used as a kind of uh, tool for genocide and, um, and even impregnating others um, with, with babies, you know, which was a way of conquering that other community with, with children who could be considered of the other, of the other side, as it were. Um, also, using sexual violence to spread HIV AIDS is another way of exterminating um, uh, a fellow community. Uh, we saw similar kinds of strategies in, in the Balkans wars in Bosnia, using sexual violence as a technique for ethnic cleansing. So, and it's in the worst instances, you could say, or in the most pervasive instances, you could say that sexual violence has been used as a tool um, for war, I mean, as a war strategy. Um, but really, as you look at conflicts, I think, around the world, there's, there's a range of ways in which it's used. Um, I think from some reports I've read on Syria, um, it seems that it's used in many different contexts in the war in Syria. Um, women in detention have been sexually violated. Men have been tortured and sexually violated as well. Um, but it, it may be also used as, as other tools of control in, in communities. Um, it's, it's part of uh, strategies of, of exploitation and domination. And um, I like to think of it as a kind of runaway norm uh, that it legitimizes expectations for just you know, the worst kind of conduct we can imagine in, in, in human terms. 
and and sexual violence is I think a peculiar kind of uh, runaway norm in the ways that it can escalate conflict and cross thresholds of violence on many different fronts at the same time and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, what are some of the new trends? Um, it's hard for me to say if if gender-based violence is actually increasing around the world. Um, surely there's a lot of reporting about it and the summit coming up in London um, indicates that there's a great deal of attention now by policymakers and certainly the grassroots communities around the world have brought attention to this and, and survivors, I'm thinking about survivors from Bosnia and many other conflicts who came forward and told their stories I think have you know really paved the path to ending the silence about sexual violence and armed conflict and have made it possible for meetings like the one that's going to happen in London um, next week to even take place. Um, well, we need to do much more research um, to really understand what are the various forms of sexual violence and armed conflicts, where does it occur and what seem to be the factors that propel it, and why does it take different kinds of forms and different types of conflicts, or why do some groups engage and others don't, and so on. So those are really um, pressing kind of um, research um, agendas that that need to be addressed so we would have a, a better sense of what the patterns are in sexual violence and armed conflict. But certainly, we know it's been going on for a long time. You can find historical records in various uh, sources um, and, and even more detailed records from the Armenian um, genocide or other conflicts earlier in the 1900s. Um, what are some of the new problems that link up with sexual violence in conflict? Um, Right now, reports estimate that there's 1.5 billion people who live in um, areas of what are called state fragility, so very weak states, um, from the intersections of violence, crime, and conflict. And so I really want to underscore that I think the intersections of crime with conflict and the way these, um, these are networked globally also um, are creating additional vulnerabilities for the question of sexual violence and, and conflict. Also, we see that these are becoming more urban than rural, um, as, as has been the case in the past. So that presents new challenges, especially from the context of gender-based violence. Um, the aspects that we're seeing today around the world of climate change um, and natural disasters that might be related to it um, also can intersect with crime and conflict and heighten um, risks of gender-based violence, whether because of resource scarcities, um, desertification, or, or flooding, or other ways that um, populations or communities are forced to flee um, slowly or sometimes in urgent um, kinds of disaster situations. So these types of displacements are also going to heighten, I think, um, gender vulnerabilities. Um, and in addition, there's an interface between migration and humanitarian crises, and it produces a mixed flow of people. And um, this is what we see in this slide, um, which is, as I say, from um, from the border of the U.S. with Mexico, um, there's a shelter um, on the right-hand corner um, that's in Nogales, Sonora, Mexico. This is the, the shelter of the, um, the, the Kino Border Initiative. It's a Jesuit organization that provides um, safe space and care and food and to, um, to migrants that have been deported or others that are at risk in, in that border community. Um, and, and and so there you see, in the case of, of the work of, of KVI, the Kino Border Initiative, that it can be challenging to discern you know, who's, who's a migrant, a traditional kind of economic migrant, and who might be fleeing violence, or who might be fleeing gender violence, or who might be fleeing criminal violence uh, related to, to drugs or, or gang, uh, gang violence in Central America or Mexico. And, and surely along the, the migration route, most refugees or migrants are facing extreme risks. Um, in particular from the control of those routes by, by cartels. Um, some estimates would indicate that 8 out of 10 uh, women would likely be uh, raped, and I'm sure that's true for girls as well. Um, so, so there are enormous um, challenges um, in, the, in the interface between migration and humanitarian crises as well. Um, in addition, the UNHCR estimates that 3.4 million people around the world are stateless, but or they, they have records of 3.4 million stateless, but estimate there could be as many as 12 million worldwide who are stateless. So that's, that's another um, indication of the extent of displacement that we have around the globe that 
also raises issues of gender vulnerability. And finally, as I'll mention later in the, in, in the, the, the remarks I'm making, um, many states are responding to um, the flows of undocumented people's um, issues with extra legal goods moving across borders um, by walling up their borders and, and putting people in detention. So um, this is bringing new challenges to us in terms of responding to humanitarian crises, in particular from the perspective of gender violence. Okay, so we could go to the next slide. Um, Gender-based violence involves a range of human rights violations, um, many different types of victims, and also many different types of perpetrators. Um, so we see here in this photograph um, an image of, of a mother with her children um, on the border of Syria um, looking towards Turkey, um, but blocked by a barbed wire fence in this case. Um, it reminds me that, that uh, when families leave their homes and seek refuge elsewhere, that it puts, it puts them immediately at risk. And one of the first challenges for staying safe is just to keep the family together. Um, so one could imagine the challenges this, this mother might have just keeping her children um, safe with her. Um, and so we could, we could imagine that along a, a, a path like this, that, that there's, there's great vulnerability um, from armed groups or other kinds of, of gangs or robbers or kidnappers or um, other opportunists that, that might take advantage of her, um, her situation. Um, victims of sexual violence can easily be um, children, um, but they can be victims in many different ways. Um, we see in many conflicts around the world that, that family members um, even in their own homes are, are violated and that armed groups will force one family member to commit atrocities against the others in sexual ways. Um, and this makes it very problematic to sort out what is a perpetrator and what is a victim in the case of sexual violence. And, and certainly in instances of child soldiers, we know that many child soldiers have been forced into armed groups. They've um, been drugged, they've gone through some type of violent type uh, of induction. Um, brainwashing, you might call it, um, and indoctrination, and breaking down their inhibitions on, on violence. And so distinguishing in, in, in terms of victims and perpetrators could be very problematic uh, when looking at the range of circumstances um, in which um, individuals find themselves in conflict zones. Uh, so I think it's useful to, to think about victimhood as complex, multifaceted, um, and also to, to raise questions about what is agency in these types of situations. Uh, that's one of the questions I struggled with the most when I wrote the book on sexual violence and our conflict, how to understand agency. And, and for some women, you know, survival sex may be the last resource that they have to feed their family. Um, so you know, how do you understand uh, women who are are brought to to make those kinds of you know really horrific choices. Um, another aspect of the violations of of um, human rights in the context of sexual violence concerns the places where it happens, um, and and really there's no space that's safe from this kind of violence. Um, when you see the documentation in conflicts around the world, you'll find that. Um, homes and fields and marketplaces and churches and mosques, um, temples, um, other sacred sites, um, hospitals, clinics, um, playgrounds, I mean all sorts of places where people would go about their daily lives um, can be um, sites of this kind of violence. And, and I think that, that should draw our attention to the fact that we need to look at the spatiality of sexual violence and armed conflict and also think um, and we'll look at this towards the end of the presentation, you know, what kinds of strategies can we design so that people can be safer in their own homes, in their own communities, um, in these kind of places that have been typically targeted um, by sexual violence. Um, also, often the perpetrators of sexual violence will stage what they do, so the locations that they choose might be part of their, their intent to um, escalate the kind of terror that, that it communicates. Um, and in addition, um, sexual violence is, is used as a tool to control or expel populations or to gain access to their lands 
or to 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 bring women or or others into into armed groups to their camps for for forced labor or for sexual slavery. Um, so there are many many different contexts in which this is take, taking place. And another important question is how women, how men or boys um, and girls navigate these kind of spaces um, and circumstances. I think we can move to the next slide. This is an image of, of uh, fighters from, from Libya, uh, rebels apparently, um, holding up some small arms and light weapons. And I wanted to use this image um, just to underscore um, the linkages between um, small arms and light weapons and, and sexual violence and armed conflict. Um, also, um, just to, to emphasize that part of the story about sexual violence and armed conflict it concerns um, negative or violent masculinities. And um, I think it's important to understand how in the world we have different kinds of masculinities. Obviously, these can be shaped by culture and tradition and um, differences from one community to another, um, even in religious terms, but um, I think we can find patterns of violent masculinities across the globe. And um, I've tried to understand these in the work I've done in relation to marginalized men or marginalized masculinities or a concept of catastrophic masculinities or failed masculinities. In other words, men who are you know, doing their best to revive for their families or, or trying to get a job or trying to get an education or trying to succeed in the terms that might be appropriate for them in their, their own communities, but finding many barriers to doing that because of lack of adequate access to education or lack of, of job opportunities, um, which, which might push them to more desperate kinds of strategies, make them vulnerable to, to the kinds of indoctrination that go along with um, many of the armed groups that uh, perpetrate sexual violence and armed conflict. And I also want to emphasize that this is all tied into global networks of, of trafficking in arms. Um, obviously the arms uh, transfer treaty is an important um, tool and the mechanisms it will provide for, for activists around the world to push back against the, the global circulation of small arms and light weapons is, is really a crucial, I think, consideration. Um, the um, the circulation of, of, of these types of small arms, of course, also makes it easy for groups to, to kidnap or, or um, uh, boys or girls and take them into armed groups and force them to use weapons because weapons are relatively small. Um, so I think it facilitates um, these small arms and light weapons, uh, facilitates um, the use of sexual violence and armed conflict, whether as a tool of economic exploitation or mechanism of domination or weapon of war element of genocide, as I said um, earlier. Um, the weapons also exacerbates insecurity uh, for, for uh, families and, and, and women and, 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 and children in particular in camps, especially if women are going to the marketplace to sell goods or um, they're going out to get water or other size, kinds of supplies. Um, the fact that there are groups around with weapons or they might infiltrated camps um, obviously exacerbates the kinds of vulnerabilities um, that are in play and it makes it more difficult for for civilians to strategize um, how they can ensure their safety in these kinds of uh, circumstances and also these weapons uh, complicate um, the efforts to trans um, to transform societies in the aftermath of conflict um, because they they these weapons stay around, you know, and the cultural norms for resolving disputes become associated with um, weapons of violence and um, definitions of, of masculine power that are linked to uh, the use of, of um, you know, rifles, AK-47s or um, handguns or grenades or whatever the case might be. So those also um, exacerbate the challenges that we face in, in post-conflict situations. The next slide. We can go to the next slide. Okay. So here we have an image of um, Zatrari, um, um, sorry, Zatri uh, uh, refugee camp in Jordan. And I chose this image because this just presents an overwhelming image of human suffering to my mind. Um, I've checked the records with UNHCR and um, at its height in 2013, 
Uh, there was as many as 200,000 uh, refugees located in this camp. Um, it was apparently one of the, the largest populations in Jordan. Um, and it reminds me that when we think about sexual violence and conflict, we have to ask ourselves, you know, what are the, the root causes, you know, behind this kind of, uh, of violence and the displacement that it causes and, and the suffering that's involved. And obviously a refugee camp like this has many stories to tell along these lines and even ongoing vulnerabilities among the, 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 the people who are living there. Um, Wilf has identified um, three um, key root causes that it's going to present in London. Um, so I'm just going to mention these briefly and I'm sure there'll be a topic of discussion later. Um, patriarchy, violent masculinity, and gender inequalities are, are crucial factors and I've highlighted those already. Um, armaments, and I made that point in the previous slide, and also the exclusion of women from um, peace processes. And, and really, um, any type of negotiation um, is, is a fundamental opportunity to, to establish new norms and to create new structures and new contexts uh, for um, opportunities in the aftermath of negotiations. And who participates at the time that those discussions are held, who has a chance to have a voice in shaping the outcomes of those negotiations is, is absolutely a crucial factor. If women aren't involved early on in these kinds of discussions, um, they're going to have a very difficult time in the aftermath of conflict um, to, to, to gain the kinds of rights or the kinds of opportunities and, and to deploy the types of strategies that will be needed to bring a gendered uh, perspective to post-conflict work. Um, so I think that we can't say enough about the importance of, of including women in negotiations, and I know this is a struggle that's ongoing right now uh, for the women in Syria. Um, and I find it somewhat dismaying that these issues were, were raised in the UN Resolution 1325 already in the year 2000, and here we are in 2014 and we're still struggling for some basic considerations like um, the, the voice of women in um, these kinds of crucial dialogues and, and negotiations. Um, Yeah, I think we can then go to the next slide. I wanted to um, bring some of this discussion home, and I mean literally home. Um, much of the political economy of violence that's generating the kind of refugee flows that we see in images like the refugee camp that I just showed um, is, is linked to global political economies of violence. And so obviously trafficking in arms the transfer of small arms and light weapons is a crucial element in that. But other kinds of global economies of violence exist, and, and we're all deeply implicated in those. Um, I'm going to try to, to talk to my students about this, but I wanted to, to share it with you from my own desk. Um, so I, using my iPhone, I took an image of some phones that I have around the house and my iPad and my computer and my keyboard, and, and in an effort to say that I'm, you know, it's into this larger um, structure of violence that is bringing um, gendered um, uh, conflict um, around the world. And we all need to do, you know, what we can in our own lives and our own ways to, to raise awareness about this and to find strategies um, to, to mitigate the ways that these global networks of, of basically political economies of violence are operating. So here's, here's my piece in, in, that, in that larger puzzle. Um, if we go to the next slide, I have an image here uh, from Sierra Leone, which um, was a conflict where um, diamonds played a crucial role in fueling the violence and um, the profit seeking. And, and those of us who you know, wear jewelry may find that we're connected to, in some way, we might be connected to conflicts that involve uh, conflict diamonds. Uh, but there are many different kinds of goods. Um, if we go to the next slide, I um, also have another image of mining. This one's from, uh, from the Congo. Um, in this case, the, the men are mining uh, wolframite and cassiterite. And um, these are crucial minerals that not only go into the kinds of technology that were in the first slide I showed, but also into medical technology or into weapons and the whole range of, of technologies in the global West. Um, and I think that at some of these political economies of violence uh, rely on displacing um, local populations and um, exploiting um, labor forces um, 
this kind of mining that you see in this picture would be called artisanal mining. It's, it's using very um, basic kinds of implements. Obviously, it's extremely dangerous, and in many places um, where this kind of mining is going on, um, people have lost their lives to the collapse of mines. Um, there are practically no safety standards in place, um, and yet uh, the production of these kind of goods, or in other cases it could be timber, for example, um, gets onto the global marketplace and um, produces large profit margins and allows us to purchase goods at, at much reduced cost. So um, I think of, of this kind of um, exploitation as a form of human rent seeking. Um, in other words, seeking, uh, um, uh, extracting rents out of humans themselves. Um, the ways that um, conflict is tied into um, criminal networks um, that traffic in, in humans, obviously, is, a, is another clear example of um, this kind of rent-seeking uh, practice. But I think it's much more pervasive than, than we've studied, and so I just want to highlight that uh, I think we can do more work on trying to understand the ways that political economies of violence are tied into um, conflicts and the type of, of exploitative economies that, that are involved in that. So I think we can take the next slide now. Here's an image again from um, Arizona, um, research I did in the field last, uh, last January. Um, this is a, a picture of um, gear for drug smuggling. And as you can see, it's, it's, it's fairly rudimentary, but I don't want to suggest that drug smuggling on the U.S. border is low tech because actually um, you can be fairly certain that these um, organizations have a great deal of technology they're using on, on their own side. But they're often pressing um, people fleeing violence from Central America or other parts of Mexico um, and coming um, to the United States. So they're often pressing them into service um, to smuggle drugs um, for various, I mean, it could happen in any number of scenarios. Um, someone might just be desperate to get back to the U.S. and and agree to smuggle, or they may be trying to pay off some kind of loans, or um, they may have no more money to pay the coyotes to take them across, the guides that take them across the mountains. So this is their, their last chance to try to get through. Uh, <clears throat> uh, they, they may have been kidnapped and, and forced to do it. Um, one can imagine all kinds of scenarios that, that may um, result in someone uh, carrying uh, packs of, of cocaine, for example, um, using these types of burlap straps that are in this photograph. Um, but the, the humanitarians that work um, to provide aid to individuals like this um, in the Kino you know, Border Initiative um, tell us that individuals who carry these kind of packs through the desert um, under conditions of extreme dehydration would end up with deep, deep cuts into their skin um, because of the weight and also because of the issues of dehydration. Uh, so it's an extremely um, a devastating kind of uh, practice um, that that involves, I think, in many instances, uh, forced labor as well. And so I, I I show this as just an example of the kind of criminalization of conflict that that we see playing itself out on the border um, between the U.S. and Mexico. Uh, there have been at least 5,000 deaths in the U.S. border on the U.S. side um, in the last, I think, probably 20 years. Um, but over the last five years or 10 years, um, there are tens of thousands of deaths that have happened between Central America and Mexico. Um, so many disappeared from Central America trying to make their way out of those areas into the U.S. And now we see many, many unaccompanied children uh, making the same kind of journey and, and really historic numbers coming into the U.S. And that may be also a trend you see elsewhere in the world. So it might be another topic um, in terms of the the kind of gendered vulnerabilities that we're, that we're experiencing. Yes, I think we can go to the next slide then. So the consequences of sexual violence and conflict. Um, this is again an image of um, overseas uh, Syrian refugees there in Istanbul. I'm looking out, sitting with a couple men, it looks like, sitting on some rocks looking out over um, the water. Um, but it reminds me that, that refugees not only um, flee, um, or displaced persons not only flee over land, but often over the water. And it also reminds me that the stories um, are told not just by, by, by women and girls, as much of the UN language would encourage us to think about, um, but 
should be told as well by, by men. And too, too, too often we don't know how sexual violence has affected men. And so there needs to be more work, I think, done to, 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 to identify the kinds of trauma, the signs of trauma that would indicate that men have been uh, violated and to provide the, the right kind of support services for them. In some ways, it's possible to, to argue that there's a more severe stigmatization for men to have been raped than for women, in part because it um, denotes in many cultures homosexuality, um, and, and men will feel um, disgraced be, because of that, or, or maybe their wives might feel they're no longer a man um, because that they, were, they were violated. So not only may women find themselves abandoned by their husbands because of sexual violence in some communities or ostracized by their communities, um, but men may be, be also abandoned. So I, I thought this image um, could um, help us uh, think about those kinds of stories and, and the, the testimonies that um, uh, people might, might bring forward. Um, and I think we could go to the next slide. So I want to talk a little bit about the gender challenges of sexual violence in the aftermath of armed conflict. This is an image of uh, people returning home um, in Afghanistan in 2004, um, there are women climbing down from a from a truck, um, which seems to have been carrying a bunch of goods that they might have had, one might imagine, in a refugee camp, um, and men are are already there to to welcome them. Um, it also brings up that sometimes uh, the women have fled and the men have stayed behind, and and so they may have different experiences from the context of war. And they may have difficulties in sorting out those different experiences and, and, and finding their way back into their family lives. Um, for Sometimes for women, they've had to assume new duties during war and their husbands return after the war and that displaces um, them from the kinds of uh, responsibilities that they might have of, of had that might have expanded their, their range of opportunities during the conflict in certain ways. Um, there may be differences in the ways that men and women relate to the injuries they received in war, especially in terms of, of sexual violence, and so that's a, that's a major consideration. Um, there may be issues of, of revenge um, in the community for finding out that who was, who was violated and who caused that violation and so on. So again, the circulation of, of small arms and, and light weapons in that context, and you can see in this photograph that, that one of the men is carrying a a weapon there um, also you know exacerbates the the issues of safety and security in the aftermath of, of conflicts including uh, for the survivors um, I remember in the context of Sierra Leone that the individuals there said after that war that it was difficult to turn the clock back that, that the boys had experienced too much power for young boys during the war and now how could how could um, they be brought up as proper men after having you know, done, um, committed atrocities or engaged in acts of, of, of sexual assaults, and how, how could the clock be turned back on that? So this may be a question that many communities confront around the world. Um, let's go on to the next slide. So I thought this, this image also from Afghanistan reminds us of the extraordinary challenges of rebuilding communities um, in the aftermath of, of, of conflict. Um, there need to be systems in place for people to report the kinds of abuses that they've suffered. Um, you need a, a sturdy judicial system. You need the, the, the law in place so that victims can come forward. You need the police trained um, to deal with um, survivor stories. Um, you need psychosocial support and, and the health care um, to assist um, survivors. So, so rebuilding communities in the aftermath of these conflicts really requires a comprehensive uh, set of responses um, across a whole range of sectors of society. And, 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 and it's very difficult, I think, to do that in many countries where the devastation has been so um, pervasive. Um, but it raises the question of impunity. If, if we can't put in place the kind of laws and, and procedures for holding people accountable for crimes 
um, against humanity for for using sexual violence as, as an element of genocide or as a weapon of war um, if we can't hold people accountable for that then we're not going to move forward I think um, to to overcome it either um, uh, can we move to the next slide then yeah so the response of the international community on this front I think has a lot of promise and also some um, challenges in, in place um, I took this this slide um, it's a it's this photograph it's an image of of European parliamentarians uh, from the Green parties um, who are um, really protesting the work of the European European uh, or the EU um, border patrol operations by Frontex um, that are not uh, providing um, rescue and protection for refugees who may be fleeing uh, from Africa or from the Middle East across the Mediterranean and trying to reach uh, European shores. And so this has prompted a campaign, um, here you see the signs of rescue and protect, uh, refugees um, arriving by sea. Um, but I'd also point out that the language of rescue and protect may sound somewhat um, um, patriarchal. Uh, the, I have some concerns with the, the notion of protection, um, that, that women and girls or women and children need to be protected. Um, to me it sounds a little bit um, patriarchal. Um, so I think we need strategies of empowerment um, as much as providing safety, let's say. Um, and rescuing, the language of rescuing could also resonate as somewhat neo-colonial uh, but I don't think that was the intent here in this particular initiative uh, because they were thinking very concretely about rescuing and protecting people who were at risk of drowning on the water um, but in the larger context of, of international initiatives I just want to highlight that I think we need to go about the idea of protection with a, a strong gendered lens and, and ask ourselves you know what kinds of strategies uh, would provide the most safety um, and, and not militarize um, the response in the context of, of protection from maybe patriarchal types of, uh, of perspectives. Um, I think also strategies that emphasize responsibility and caring are very powerful. Um, the example that I gave you in the, some previous slides of the work of the Kino Border Initiative on the border um, with the United States and Mexico is obviously um, responding to local needs um, showing that the local community has the responsibility and is willing to assume that responsibility. There are many humanitarian um, organizations and workers and volunteers, some of them in their 70s and their 80s, um, who, who travel in the desert in that region and put bottles of water out and food and um, socks and, and shoes and things that would help people survive and make their way through the desert to safety. Um, in spite of the kinds of uh, militarization strategies along the border that are being carried out by um, the US government in an attempt to shut down the, the border crossings. Um, so there's a paradox there. I mean, do we respond to human suffering? Do we respond to that with uh, a framework of caring and, um, and reconciliation? Um, I think we could go to the next slide then. Yeah, so I, I want to encourage um, the efforts that we, that we make going forward to, to think about how we can mitigate gender vulnerabilities, not only in crisis situations. This photograph is an image of, um, I suppose, a mother walking down um, the street with, with a young boy, it looks like. Um, again, in the uh, Zatar, uh, Zatri uh, refugee camp um, in Jordan. Um, and this is the part of the camp where there are shops and um, markets and um, how can we provide not only opportunities and safety for, for women um, and others at risk of gender violence in these types of crisis situations or other camps of displacement, how can we also do that in um, urban settings where, where refugees or the displaced or the undocumented um, may become lost to to UN agencies or other um, non-governmental organizations that respond to conflict and suffering around the world. How can we identify where those needs are um, so that um, women are not forced to survival sex to, to, to make um, a meal for their families or 
so that their children aren't at risk of, of being trafficked for labor or for sexual purposes and so on. Um, part of the strategies for, for responding to this upfront um, include national action plans reporting on the women peace security agenda um, and um, everywhere around the world where we have opportunities to do that I think we need to use peacetime to secure as, as much of that agenda as possible and then again as I said earlier to support the work of women to be included in peace negotiations so that they can begin to build those national action plans into the peace process itself. Um, can we go to the last slide then? Oh, this is uh, Safe Spaces. So, uh, again, that's the Kino Border um, Initiative image um, that I had earlier. Um, so, I'm not going to um, repeat that more. So, I think there's just one more slide past that one. Oh, here we go. <laughs> there's two more then left. Um, so, transforming society. So, besides creating national action plans, it occurs to me that, that we also have to work on transforming our culture. And I like these two images a lot from that perspective. Um, on the left, uh, there's, a, there's a picture of a motorcycle. Um, this is again from Bukavu. Um, and at the front of the motorcycle, um, the, the, the taxi driver here has appropriated a sign from a, a vehicle maybe used by the United Nations or another non-governmental organization that has a, a red um, X um, through um, a, um, like an AK-47. So in other words, uh, this, this, this uh, motorcycle has been uh, demilitarized. <laughs> and I thought that was, that was really cool because um, to me that, that's a way of helping to create safe spaces to say that I'm not part of the, the violence, um, the militarized violence uh, that we've experienced and I'm declaring that that my participation here in this community and, and the way I go about my, my job um, is in, in a nonviolent kind of way. Um, and if I was in that community and I was deciding which uh, taxi driver I was going to choose, I think I would go with this one. Um, in uh, the other image to the right, there's a, there's a mural in a community in uh, Bogota in Colombia, and the mural says, no more violence against women. And again, I think um, it's an example of trying to bring the message of, of transforming um, uh, gendered um, practices and gendered norms and gendered expectations that, that are part of local um, communities um, into the setting of, of that community itself. Um, so there, there are many different ways to do this, but I think these two images show um, attempts um, in different parts of the world um, that are part of the, the campaign, certainly, that um, um, Wilf is putting forward in London um, next week. And then to the last slide. So to finish it off here, I just wanted to point out that among the new trends that I think we have to think about in terms of challenges of gender violence around the world um, in conflict situations is the extent to which many countries are bordering up or walling up their borders. Um, and part of this process is including detention centers and in a way I think we're moving towards the criminalization of, uh, of refugees, whether they're seeking asylum, um, whether they're um, refugees from, from economic um, crises and criminal, um, the nexus of, of economic and criminal uh, violence or they're fleeing from natural disasters and the mix of that uh, with climate change and other types of uh, deprivations um, and, and, and risk from conflict. So I think this is going to be a, a really great challenge going forward. Um, there's more and more ways that countries are carrying out surveillance not only along their borders but uh, with respect to the to movement of peoples around the world and um, our humanitarian responses to sexual violence and armed conflict um, have to think about um, these, these um, I think, more contemporary um, kinds of, uh, of challenges as well. It's certainly the case that um, individuals who've been already traumatized by war, um, perhaps sexually violated, who are then um, put in detention, sometimes in isolation, um, are going to suffer severe consequences um, from that kind of treatment. So we really need to have strategies that will help to identify um, who's been traumatized and, and, and what are you know, forms of caring and, and, and um, community responses that are based on that kind of responsibility um, to those types of needs when, when, when individuals reach 
our countries, whether it's over sea or whether it's over land um, kinds of, of crossings. So that's where I'm going to end, and I think I kept almost exactly to an hour. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, Janie, for that fantastic So now I think we're going to... It's perfectly in time. Um, so now we're going to take questions. Um, so the way to ask a question is to push the button with the hand logo. That way I can see you've raised your hand and I can unmute you. Um, so I will give you time now to raise your hand, um, but we already got one question that was written by Brianne Gallagher, so I will read that out to uh, Janie so you can start with that one. Um, Brianne writes, many sexual assault and violence prevention programs such as in the US military often focus on targeting women as the ones who need to take certain measures in order to avoid sexual violence. How do we, as scholars and activists, reframe the discussion and bring attention to the politics of militarized masculinities? Are there any feminist grassroots organizations that focus on working with men and reframing dominant ideas about masculinity and femininity in relation to the processes of militarization? So from my experience, I can already say yes, because Wilf works with those types of organizations, but I'll let um, Janie answer and then we'll go to the to some of the oral questions. So go ahead, Janie. Okay, thank you. Yeah, feel free to share names of those organizations um, as well. Um, I have to say that I think, I, I, I find it really problematic to, to, um, to understand how we can move away from militarized masculinity when we are looking at context of, of military organizations. And I think they've been founded historically on um, violent masculinities, and it's, it's very difficult to disentangle those kinds of masculinities from um, the types of gendered violence that, that we see in, in within uh, military organizations in many parts of the world. So I, I think it's an ongoing challenge. Uh, certainly this is very true for the U.S. military, uh, but it's true for other military organizations around the world. Um, and one of the criticisms I was pointed out in the book that I wrote on sexual violence and armed conflict was that not only do we need to look at sexual violence in conflict as something that occurs from, from one armed group onto another community, um, but also the kinds of sexual violence that occurs within militaries themselves. And I think that's a really um, important point. Um, I took note that the, the summit um, dialogue that's going to take place next week um, includes a session among the ministers on uh, using the military for protection and and again I would, I would just underscore here my own concerns that um, I think it's very difficult to imagine how we can effectively use highly m militarized masculinity um, as a form of responding to sexual violence and conflict um, perhaps it could be you know some research done along these lines in terms of of um, countries that have been contributing to peacekeeping um, operations, but again there we also know that sometimes the peacekeepers have themselves been involved in acts of sexual violence and peacekeeping operations and exploitation. Um, so I think it's, it's, a, it's a difficult um, approach um, in any case and one that we need to work on a lot all around the globe. All right, thank you, Janie. So time for more questions. Um, I see Claire Princess Ayaloton from, I think France has her hand up. So Claire, I'm unmuting you now, go ahead. Now, go ahead. Hi, Claire. Hi, I have already, I think I posted the, okay, let me just, my question actually is on, um, the first one I asked was about the last slide on overcoming new barriers. I actually wanted to find out if that's not the same border fence where male immigrants jumped over in the middle of the night last week from Morocco to Spain to enter into Spain. There was there was there was this mass male immigrant. So it was it was televised, and I mean there were more than hundred. They just jumped the fence. I mean they were able to. I mean to pull down the fence to, to come in into Spain. I know they couldn't nobody could I mean nobody could they couldn't get them back. They couldn't push them back. So I don't know if that's the same 
if there's the same uh, fence, the same border fence on the, I mean, that, that was shown on the last slide. And then another thing again is my last question is about the European Union because um, as a French woman, actually, I just, there's, at the moment, there's a verge of uh, this, um, this problem of um, anti-immigrants going on right now in France, just like anti-immigrant policy, which is going on at the same time also in the, um, that was voted in Switzerland. And I think now with the rising of the, the, uh, the National, Front, uh, uh, National Front Party, we are seeing a movement whereby they are trying to pull back immigrants from entering into France and embracing immigrants as I mean as as usual. And now the problem is with the with the with the conflict in Syria, in Ukraine, and we don't know what is going to happen in most of these European countries very soon because now there is another another demonstration going on in Spain. How do we how do we tend to attend to women, especially most of these immigrants, most of these people, displaced people are single mothers. They don't have anywhere to go to. How do we tackle the issue of anti-immigrant? I mean, they are being confronted with, with this anti-immigrant policy. And how do we embrace that with accepting them into the community, into I mean, getting to, I mean, taking care of them in this aspect? Because if we, if we are, we are slapping this, this anti-immigrant policy on their faces, then we will not have the possibilities or the opportunity of providing for them and in that, in that area, they are exposed to, to sexual violence more than we can even imagine. So I don't, my question is, how do we deal with this issue? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have a couple more questions that are written. I'll read them out and then Jenny, you can take them uh, maybe three at the same time. Um, Alan okay. Ware uh, writes, it's more of a comment. She writes, the White Ribbon Project in New Zealand is an initiative led by men for men to say that violence against women is not okay. It uses male celebrities. It is not focused primarily on sexual violence in the military, but more across all sections of society. On the military side, the New Zealand peacekeeping operation in Bougainville was totally unarmed and did this with support of women's groups in Bougainville. So that's Alan's um, comment. And Samina asks, um, how and what have we done for the change of mass media images of military masculinity through films and other form of art to show and preach these conflicting images throughout, throughout the world? All right, so Janie, I'll let you take those. <laughs> yes, I mean, I think that uh, a key challenge really um, for the women's movement is, is not only to, to focus on how we can transform gender violence by empowering women, by mobilizing women to support survivors and, and find strategies to respond to, to sexual violence in those terms, but also um, to find ways to create alternative types of masculinity and support male communities who can work uh, on that side of the, um, the equation. So I think um, the example from New Zealand is, is fascinating. Um, and um, also, the idea of unarmed peacekeepers obviously is, is a great um, notion because it helps to move away from the militarization of masculinity and the militarization of, of protective responses. Um, um, so that, that can provide an alternative and, and so this example is, is, I think, important in that context. Um, I think I, I lost the second question or the third question. Yeah, it was on how we, uh, on mass media, um, I can get the question back oh, right. in one second. Um, here we go. Yeah, I mean, I, from, from my perspective in the United States, um, I mean, it seems to me that, that we're more likely to find images and film um, and in various kinds of mass media that, that um, elevate um, militarized masculinity or hypermasculinity uh, when we're talking about um, um, the US, US military force in itself. Um, I remember I was going to give a talk uh, once in Indiana and I traveled through the airport in Chicago uh, on my way there and I saw this, this huge sign um, advertising a luxury vehicle, a luxury car, and there was a 
a man standing in the image um, with a with a car key, but it was in the shape of a chainsaw. It was like a gold-plated chainsaw car key, and I just couldn't believe this. Um, so, but I think that's that's a really good example of how the mass media plays on images of what we might call hegemonic masculinity. So, this man was depicted in a in a suit with um, you know probably very fine leather shoes and a beautiful tie and a wonderful haircut and so on, and um, and yet to make him really militarized masculine, you know, his his key was depicted as a as a chainsaw, and so that kind of marketing, you know, um, plays into our mindsets about what is the real man and um, this these kinds of, of social institutions, um, as Cynthia Enloe would certainly say, um, you know, are are a lot of work to to construct and to sustain. Um, and the mass media plays, you know, a really important role in that process. Um, I think it's it's incumbent on us to find alternative images and to promote those. And and the the sign that that I showed a picture of from Colombia um, certainly is is trying to counter those types of hegemonic um, images. Um, and and that sign was part of a, a a program by an alternative media platform that's working for peace and and, and gender issues in in Colombia. So. We need more of those kind of, of, of initiatives. If you go back to that slide, um, you'll see the the link, and it will, you can see on the on the sign itself the the link to the organization that was sponsoring that that particular um, mural. Thank you, Jamie. Um, we have two more written questions. The first is from Primus. Uh, sorry if I'm butchering names, <laughs> um, but. Let's see, Primus, would you like to ask your question? Because you, I saw you also wrote it, but please don't be shy to also ask it orally. Um, you're unmuted. Go ahead. Hello. Hi. Hey, yeah, are you getting me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. I'm just, uh, I just wish to ask that with, with all the debate, that have been going on over the past decade on sexual violence in armed um, uh, uh, conflict. Do we have any strong evidence that this practice has has been has declined in areas of armed conflict? And to what extent can can we uh, attribute the the, the growing debate on this issue, on the possible decline on sexual violence in armed conflict. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Okay. Thank you, um, Emma. I wasn't quite sure if I heard the question right. Did, was I... Prima, Prima was asking, do we have evidence that that sexual violence in armed conflict is declining? It, yeah, the, he's also written it down. It's is there any concrete evidence that this barbaric practice of sexual violence and armed conflict is un, is in a decline in conflict settings? So he's asking about the numbers. Right. Yes, I think it's very difficult for us to make a, a judgment about trends in those terms. Um, is it increasing or is it decreasing? Um, partly because historically there was so much silence around this issue that we don't have strong documentation um, from earlier than, than the 19, the earliest part would be in the early 1900s. I think the Armenian conflict is fairly well documented. The, um, the rape of Nanking is another example that's fairly well documented. Um, violence um, in, 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 in India with Bangladesh, Pakistan, um, the separation, um, that's fairly well documented. Um, so we have some, you know, historical context from different periods, and some historical context, obviously, from the the survivors of of um, the Japanese sexual atrocities from World War II um, in Korea or other parts of the world. Um, so we have we have some documentation like that, but nothing as extensive as we might have today because of the mobilization of non-governmental organizations around the world. And, um, and 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 the courage, especially of women, to come forward 
um, and to tell their stories and to document these in, in various formats, um, to participate in tribunals and um, to to confront the stigmatization in their own societies and communities and say enough, um, we have to combat the impunity um, with this kind of uh, crime. Um, so I think it's it's hard for us because of a lack of of a strong historical documentation on the pervasiveness of of sexual violence and conflicts in the past, um, coupled with the increased reporting, but also taking note that probably nonetheless these types of incidents are still extremely underreported. Um, so it's a very difficult topic to to be able to establish concrete um, trends around based on the types of information that we have today. Um, however, it's, it's certainly true that the more equality that we can promote in gender terms um, in societies around the world, um, the less violent those societies um, those societies are. So it's it's probably the most powerful strategy for peace building that we can pursue. All right. Thank you. I have uh, three wit written ones and one hand up. So first I'll read out uh, Jamie Hagen's question and then I'll give Barbara O'Dwyer the floor. Um, Jamie Hagen asks, you briefly mentioned how people of different gender identities may experience increased sexual violence in post-conflict settings. Can you speak more directly about how sexual violence impacts the LGBT community in post-conflict? Do you know any efforts to research this or address this in monitoring or implementation of gender peace and security initiatives? So that's Jamie's question. And then I'll give the floor also to Barbara O'Dwyer. Uh, go ahead, Barbara, you're unmuted. Oh, sorry, do you want, you want me to ask my question now? Yeah. Yes, go ahead, Barbara. Okay, thanks. Um, sorry, it's quarter. It's twenty past three in the morning here, Jenny. So if my if I'm a bit incoherent, <laughs> it's because I'm getting very tired. We sorry, I'm I'm in Canberra in Australia. Um, we had a a big meeting the other day um, as a preliminary to the UK summit, and it was it was instigated by the by our Minister for Foreign Affairs here. So and it was held at Parliament House. So there was um, a huge number of of people from NGOs who had a lot who have a lot of first hand experience. There were academics. And there were um, some government people, including several people from the defence forces here. So there was a really wide range of people with experience and, and expertise in, in sexual violence in conflict. Um, I don't think anything particularly new came out of it uh, because part of the part of the problem is that there's already so much research and so many tools. And and guidelines and training manuals, etc., available. But the problem is the resources aren't being put into implementing any of them. And the other, the other thing that's not done um, in the beginning, when 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 we're trying to do any sort of programs, is is um, just the sheer lack of gender analysis that's done in the very beginning of any program. So I was wondering whether you had any good examples of or any sort of advice on, I mean it's not that people don't know how to do a gender analysis, it's just that it's not given given the priority that it should. So whether you've got some good examples of where and how that's been done and whether and where and, and whether it's been effective and and just um, I mean, I don't expect you to have answers about how to apply the resources, but again, you know, if you've got any any examples of how that how that has been handled and how training and guidelines. I mean, UNHCR, for instance, has had perfectly good um, policies and guidelines on how to deal with, you know, the setup of camps, refugee camps. I mean, they've had that since the mid 1990s. 20 years ago and it's they still don't have the resources for actually implementing everything. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Jamie and, and Barbara for those questions. Um, I'll try to take them in turn. Um, 
the I think the LGBT community is at some particular risks during um, during conflicts, um, partly because of the pressure on communities to mobilize around traditional gender role expectations, and so anyone who's in an LGBT community uh, will fall outside of, of those expectations right away, and um, you know that can, that can be labeled the traitors or um, you know someone aiding the enemy and that kind of thing. Um, and also just because of the confusion of, of sexual violence, especially against men, with acts of homosexuality, um, I think that that paints you know, a really broad brush in, in some cultures, in some countries, uh, that, that can you know, really put um, people who are um, survivors of sexual violence or people who are from the, the LGBT community at risk. I know that in, um, in Uganda there's been an effort to respond to um, men who have been sexually violated, uh, particularly from eastern Congo, but obviously there are issues in, in Uganda itself with respect to um, the laws on um, homosexuality. So um, I think this is an area where there's probably not a lot of research done systematically and um, if you're interested in this topic, I would you know, really encourage you, Jamie, to, to work on it because I think there's a lot to be um, contributed to um, in, on that front. And, and again, uh, LGBT um, community you know, could be part of the armed forces or um, you could have individuals caught in, in the conflicts themselves. And so their experiences, um, I think, have to be much better documented and understood than we have uh, so far. Um, Barbara, it's great to hear from you from um, Canberra um, and know that you're engaged in the meetings leading up to London. Um, I'm thinking about, um, well, Wilf has a really excellent study um, that put on their, their homepage um, about um, meetings that have been held between Syrian and Bosnian women. Um, and I think that provides a really wonderful um, angle on gender analysis drawing from the experience of the Bosnian women and um, engaging, you know, the ongoing um, struggles of the Syrian women in that context. So, I, you know, I think that's just a really terrific initiative that Wolf has taken on and it provides a really good example of, I think, some of the best kind of work that we can do around the world to draw on women who really have a deep understanding of these issues and, and experience and much to share and, and contribute to the struggle that other women are um, going through at the very time um, um, today. Um, also, I was uh, involved in a in a, a conversation with uh, an official from the Philippines who's in, engaged on on the trafficking, the interagency trafficking um, task force, and um, that conversation was really focused on the intersection of uh, natural disasters, thinking about the the hurricane that just devastated uh, the Philippines, and um, and, and also trafficking and, and conflict. And um, so I, I can say that the, the, the government in the Philippines is you know, really trying to find its way through um, these intersections. And um, they're very much aware of, of risks, gender violence risks that, that women uh, in particular or girls might face in the, in the, the camps that they set up to, to provide refuge for the displaced. Uh, one interesting strategy they had was to, to print uh, material on uh, fans um, that they that they made to distribute in these centers um, that would that would bring attention to issues of, of, of the risks of trafficking and gender violence. Um, and uh, in the Philippines, it's it's a custom to um, to make fans out of just about anything you can find, I guess, from what my friends tell me from the Philippines. And um, so they very cleverly used that that cultural artifact as a way to distribute widely um, uh, to 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 individuals um, who would be at risk, um, information to to raise their awareness of how to get a, get assistance and how to confront those risks. So I think that's that's like a really excellent example of of um, that kind of work. Um, I know he said that that they found that in some rescue centers they had set up set up in Mindanao where the conflict is ongoing, um, that there were instances of prostitution within the camps. And so um, again, um, as 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 you pointed out, Barbara, we we know. Um, since a long time that the camps need to have a lot of uh, um, strategies, gender strategies used to, to ensure that the vulnerabilities are, are mitigated um, for the camp residents. Um, 
Um, but um, this is, I think, an ongoing kind of struggle in many different parts of the world. All right, thank you, Jamie. So we have more questions? Yes, we do. We have uh, three more written questions. And also, just to add to what you answered to Barbara, um, Wilf actually was the one who uh, did the latest evaluation of the uh, age, gender, diversity policy of UNHCR. Um, the report we did on that is on the website in case you, you're interested in that. Um, all right, so we have three more questions. Um, they're all written. So again, please don't be shy to raise your hand and ask the question directly. Uh, the first is from Claire again. She asks, how do we deal with anti-immigrant policy to tackle and prevent reoccurrences of sexual violence among sexually abused immigrant women? So that's the first. Then we have uh, a question from Lauren Mumford. She writes, I was intrigued by the slide from the intersection in Bukavu, especially because the sign mentions two factors that have been difficult to link, GBV in conflict and the transmission of HIV AIDS. You also mentioned the intention to transmit as a motivation for rape in conflict. Could you elaborate more on what you have read or seen in your experience writing your book or other works on the connection between HIV transmission and SGBV in conflict? And then the final question by Sharon Davis is, uh, can you talk about research sources that are looking at the link of climate crisis and the doctrine of adaptation impacts on women? All right, I'm glad I don't have to answer these. <laughs> so go ahead, Jamie. And... <laughs> well, these are, these are all excellent questions and also very challenging questions, I have to say. Um, I want to go back to Claire because I, I, I realized I didn't answer her question from before um, about um, immigrants. So um, I, I think that, um, well, there's an example here locally in Connecticut where um, the nonprofit organizations that are receiving uh, refugee women and immigrant women um, or, or men and boys um, are screening them for evidence of trauma and, and that would include um, sexual violence. So I think that it's possible to set up programs in countries around the world that are uh, processing immigrants or refugees and many times I think they can be mixed populations. Um, that, that should The processing of those individuals should be set up in a way so that this kind of trauma is identified. And again, I think that the signs of the trauma may differ between men and women, um, so there has to be some sensitivity to how to pick up the signals um, for, for that kind of evidence. Um, yes, and in the case of uh, the Quito Border Initiative on the border with, with the U.S. and Mexico, um, the Jesuits have a safe house for women, and so women there who are particularly vulnerable, and they identify those in the, in the group of of, of deportees or, or migrants that they're that they're servicing in their in their soup kitchen, um, they they can be provided shelter in the safe house for a period of time until they're able to make some other plans um, um, and 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 either be relocated in their home country or um, find relatives um, in Mexico or whatever it might might be the case. Um, so that kind of safe space then provides this interim um, strategy. Uh, for 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 victims um, of sexual violence or um, women at particular risk of, of this, or they may be traveling with children and at particular risk. Um, the intersection. Lauren Lauren was asking about the intersection um, between rape and uh, HIV/AIDS. Um, well, I think it's quite well documented in the case of of the genocide in Rwanda that that. Um, Men who knew they had HIV/AIDS uh, were committing rape with the idea that that they would they would spread the infection, and it therefore would would cost the lives of of the, the women that they had infected in um, the, the the opposing community. Um, so I, I think in that sense it was really used as a kind of weapon of war. Um, I sense that perhaps in other conflicts, if if men think that they have rape. Or sorry, that they have HIV/AIDS, they may feel like there's really not a lot to lose, uh, so they don't have inhibitions of their own um, against committing um, acts of sexual violence, and 
Um, so that could be a factor too in, in some instances. Um, also, of course, in some conflicts, there's a lot of mythology around um, um, raping or having sex with a virgin or um, or women from the from the opposing side. That this would provide some kind of uh, magical protection or some bulletproofing uh, for the men, or it might protect them from HIV/AIDS. So the mythologies. Um, that surround armed conflict, um, the kind of technologies you might say that armed groups use to enhance their protection. Um, and this varies quite a bit from, from one culture to the next, but you certainly can find this whether you're looking at the drug cartels in Mexico or you're looking at situations in Sierra Leone or Eastern Congo, you, you can find these types of mythologies or technologies um, invoked in, in, in all these different types of settings. And how those intersect with um, with HIV AIDS is, is an important question, I think. All right. Um, so that leaves, yes, that leaves. Did I leave off? Did I leave off a question? Yeah, it's the one about uh, the research sources that are looking at the link of climate crisis and the doctrine of adaptation impact on women. I don't have a, a reference that I can give immediately to that. Um, so I don't know. I'm not sure who asked that, but if they contacted me on my email at the university, I could try to provide them something. All right. Um, that, was, I, I, uh, that was Sharon Davis. Um, so maybe we can put you in touch after the webinar. Okay. Great. Okay. So then we have a question from Jessica Smith. She asks, you spoke about the risks and experiences of women in Bosnia and Syria. What similarities exist between these two contexts? How can we in the academic community support processes of knowledge sharing between these two groups of women? So I'm going to take the liberty to just jump in a little bit um, and, and tell you a bit about uh, what Wilf did there. And then of course, Janie, please uh, add to, uh, to, to my answer. Um, we, Wilf organized a major conference uh, recently in Bosnia uh, to, ha to give uh, Bosnian women and Syrian women a space to meet and share experiences. Um, for both of the groups, um, it, the whole, um, the, the experience was a, a very long process because they first had to come together among themselves and, you know, think about the Bosnian women, for example, had to think of what they had learned and what their lessons were that they wanted to share with the Syrian women. Um, so the extended report of everything that was exchanged is on the website, but in general, the main lesson that came out of it that was repeated over and over and over again is get in early on the peace negotiations. That was the biggest advice the Bosnian women gave to the Syrian women. And that was the, the main thing that Syrian women took away from it, that if you're not fighting for a place at the table, at the peace table from the very beginning, then you're going to be excluded from the entire process, like happened in Bosnia. So that's why Wilf has been working very hard to try to get the Syrian women to Geneva, to the peace table here. All right, so I just wanted to add that, Janie, feel free. Yeah, I think I won't elaborate on that. I, I think I drew the same conclusion from that report, and I think I highlighted that perspective earlier in my remarks. So um, I, I, they, they can't be emphasized too much that, that women need to be involved as early as possible in, in uh, building you know, solutions to these conflicts. All right, so uh, I don't have any more written questions right now. Does anybody else have any questions? Now would be the time to raise your hand. Just click the hand button or type another question if you prefer. I do have one more question from Barbara. Um, she asks, how can we use technology for prevention and protection of sexual violence? You mentioned it briefly, but um, if you could expand, that would be great. So the question was, how can we use uh, uh, technology for violence? For prevention, prevention? And, for prevention and protection. 
Yeah. Well, um, there's some interesting platforms. Um, there's an organization in Kenya called Ushahidi that have worked on trying to um, crowdsource um, to to locate, you know, where are sources of violence and um, you know provide tools through cell phones uh, for individuals to report in their local communities and and that information to be assembled and so you can identify where there are patterns of, of violence or or increasing tensions um, in societies. So there's that kind of uh, platform that's already been um, developed, and I, th I think they've also used it in, 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 in the context of some humanitarian crises as well. Um, I know that uh, many shelters uh, for domestic violence you know, want to see that, that, that women have cell phones and that they have you know, that kind of a tool as a, as a, as a source of, um, you know, so they can make telephone calls in the, in the event of some kind of emergency. Um, I think one of the, the greatest challenges is if we can provide safety and protection um, in some locations uh, for survivors or, or refugees, um, we still need to think how can that safety and how can that protect protection um, go with them back to their home communities. And so my sense is that we need to, to do more research about how to extend um, that and maybe there are forms of technology that could help with that. I think the cell phone has certainly been um, a really vital tool in many parts of uh, the developing world um, in organizing um, marketplaces and participation in, in, in international markets and um, organizing uh, local communities and reaching out to the rest of the world. So. Um, I think probably the cell phone is, you know, really a great um, tool that we could probably use more. I think that was our last question. Uh, this is everybody's last chance to raise your hands or touch something. Nope. All right. So then we're going to go to closing. So this is where I say goodbye to you and I hand over again to Barbara. So for me, at least, thank you very, very much for, or, uh, for attending this webinar, and I hope to see you next time. Um, Barbara, you are unmuted. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you, Jenny, for your very informative and interesting presentation and for showing us the uh, complexity of sexual violence and its causes and consequences. And also thank you all for your participation and for your excellent questions. My special thanks to a few participants that we have from Australia because it really made my day that some of you stayed until 3 or 4 a.m. to join us today. It's really wonderful. Feminist peace activists are wonderful in general. <laughs> and uh, for those of you who are joining the Global Summit to End Sexual Violence next week in London, please check our side events and please join us if you are interested if some of them and finally uh, if you have any questions please feel free to contact Emma or myself and we'll do our best to get back to you thank you thank you very much <laughs>